Jamie Pritchett, who is a, a well-known uh, John Cage scholar. And a number of us were out for dinner one night. And he said, you know, there's a field that does what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I looked at him like, what? And he said, it is called ethnomusicology. <laughs> So I was very curious, and he said, you should meet this amazing professor at NYU named Kay Chalamet, and that was the beginning and the end. I went and met her. I took one class, Introduction to Ethnomusicology, and then kept going, essentially. I finished my master's at NYU then um, went up to Wesleyan for my PhD. That's how I got in. I'm originally from Mexico City and I started playing guitar and music with my family and then I moved to the States. And I really arrived to at musicology as many of my colleagues do, but kind of by accident because I was, student, I was studying music and I met Dale Olson at Florida State University and he said to me, you know, um, the discipline could use somebody like you, you know, who is from the culture and you can, I mean, if you like this music, wouldn't you like to know more about the music? I was like, yeah, I didn't think about that. Um, coming from Mexico, you know, if you want to study music, you, you study either kind of like Western art music. Back then, I don't know how, how much now, but back then, you know, studying the music that I was playing, which is trios and boleros, is not something that you study at the university level. Um, so that opportunity to study that music at the university level is what attracted me and he invited me to be part of the ethnomusicology program at Florida State and that's how I arrived into it. Once I learned more about, um, you know, the goals of ethnomusicology, I was like, yes, this is what I want to do. I mean, music, culture, anthropology, sociology, you name it, it was, um, it was the, 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 convergence of all these ideas that attracted me. So I grew up um, in Nigeria and um, I am the product of a, of a Nigerian father and a Trinidadian mother. And so um, I grew up really thinking about identity, thinking about blackness, um, thinking about the differences in culture, you know, for, for my father and my mother, my father's people, my mother's people. Um, and I sort of trace this interest um, from childhood into um, my undergraduate studies, um, where I, I um, focused in on um, literature of the African diaspora, um, took, took that into a master's, both in, in Nigeria. Um, and during my master's, I decided to focus again on literature of the diaspora, but um, focus mostly on poetry and looked at um, African-American poetry. Um, and when I started studying Langston Hughes and Amiri Baraka, um, I started thinking about or hearing the cadence of the poetry and decided that I wanted to compare because all this time I'd been also interested in, in music. Um, so I thought I would compare their cadences and align them with the with the jazz of, of their era. So Langston Hughes and Louis Armstrong, Amiri Baraka and Miles Davis. Um, and I just got caught in the um, in the the potential that music can can offer in terms of um, expounding on the histories and the expression of, of black people. And so um, so that's kind of how I came into the study of music was through the study of poetry. And um, and then I heard about this thing called ethnomusicology. Um, and so a few years later, I decided um, I had heard about it and um, we didn't have ethnomusicology in Nigeria, but um, I had a wonderful pro professor who actually met Ruth Stone. I don't even know if she's ever heard this, but he met Ruth Stone at a conference um, and or something. And, um, and then he sent me the Indiana University um, bro brochure, and um, and that's how I that's how I heard about ethno, that's how I heard about Indiana, um, and so I applied. Everything sort of aligned, um, and it's become a really wonderful field for me um, as I've thought about the the 
the history of my of my parents, but also the history of Black people um, worldwide. Yeah, I was uh, playing music for a while before I really understood anything about ethnomusicology. I, I started teaching myself how to play guitar in my 20s. Um, my only music background before that was, was some, some choir in junior high and high, high school. And I was really, I was uh, teaching myself because I, um, I wanted to further my organizing work and do some, some sort of musical, uh, musical political work. In, um, I, I was just becoming a full-time organizer at the time. Formed my own band um, pretty quickly thereafter, and uh, then was uh, uh, brought into a group called the Irish Brigade, which was a kind of crazy ensemble in Madison, Wisconsin, back in 1974 or something like that. And um, so we found myself playing um, concertina and guitar in a Irish brigand, Irish brigade, Irish band, uh, traditional and rebel music. <laughs> And the uh, the local radio station WORT, in, which was ju just forming, wanted to do a world music radio show. I didn't quite know what that meant, mm -hmm. but they had me in and hired me to um, to run this show called On the Horizon. And I was I mentioned this uh, yesterday at the the talk, but the reason apparently that I got that job uh, was that I was not an ethnomusicologist. Uh, they said uh, we don't want somebody who's going to play three hours of drum music from Upper Volta. We had somebody who you know can, can understand an audience and do it. So there, I, I encountered the term. It was not in a positive uh, valence, uh, but I've, a few years later, I was. I turned out I was kayaking with a an ethnomusicologist, a student, and didn't understand what she did either. Uh, yeah, flash forward a couple of years, and I was uh, moved out to Seattle. Um, was finding uh, uh, couldn't get work for various reasons. Thought I'd go back to school, and they had ethnomusicology as a as a subject that you could study as an undergraduate. I was a dropout, um, and it seemed to bring together a lot of things. I was newly interested in Latin American percussion. Uh, I'd been playing Irish music, been doing this show. I knew a lot of what was out there in terms of recorded music, um, and uh, just sort of in <clears throat> on the spur of the moment picked. Picked a major, uh, but it seemed like something that I uh, I could um, I could follow through on and, and enjoy doing maybe for quite a long time. Uh, and my my professors responded well to me. We um, they got me the money to go to graduate school. So it was a series of accidents in a way, um, but I found myself uh, exactly where I wanted to be. You know, I think I might be like many people in that I just didn't even know it was a field. I didn't know it exists, and somebody brought it to my attention because my whole life I had been playing music of, you know, the Filipino diaspora community. And then somebody said, you know, you can go to grad school to do something like, oh, Pisha, you can't do that. And it turned out to be a real field. Um, and as I looked into it, it really appealed to me because I found out it was a little more on the anthropological side, a little more on the talking with community member side than it was on the, you know, the pure musical analysis, um, the kinds of things I had done in music theory. And so I said, well, that sounds like a fabulous field. It is so mythical that I might as well give it a go. You know, I had a kind of a windy path before that anyway, where I wasn't quite sure what my major was going to be. I changed it along the way. I then went into computers, and then ethnomusicology popped up, and it was the one thing that seemed really resonant. It, seemed, it felt really good to me, so that's why I pursued it. I come from Ghana, and um, as you can imagine, uh, post-colonial Ghana. And for us, um, once ethnomusicology musicology opened the way uh, to the study of music from other cultures. Uh, most people from post-colonial Africa, um, we, 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 well, let me say, I myself, I came to ethnomusicology by choice uh, because that will allow me uh, to bring uh, the music uh, or musical practices and everything that's associated with it from my village from that part of the world to the central pool of um, world academic discourse about music. And so for me, um, that was the main reason why I enrolled in ethnomusicology. Of course, that was even when I came to the United States uh, that I realized because after my master's, um, 
I had my master's in Western music theory, and after that, I asked them, I said, what is it that I can study so that I can bring the music? Because everything that I've studied so far doesn't talk about the music from my village, and I'm from a village. So they said, then you have to study ethnomusicology, and then that's, that's how I did, and I pursued it and all that. I was teaching in schools. I was always interested in music from far places in the world. Uh, I grew up uh, in Cleveland, and at that time and place, there was what was referred to as ethnic radio. Uh, and every hour, there was a different radio program dedicated to communities. And so, um, particularly on the weekends, you know, we'd go from the Metropolitan Opera to the Polish hour, to the German hour, the Slovenian hour, the Hungarian hour, a lot of Eastern European you know, kind of thing, because that was, you know, a good uh, chunk of the communities at the time. And so I was interested in that, uh, uh, um, the radio, and so by way of that, I uh, became interested also in the people who made the music. And as I grew and stayed there for a while longer, I wound up uh, um, going to Ohio University, then coming back to Kent State University, where there was an ethnomusicology program evolving at an earlier time uh, with Halim el Dab and Terry Miller. And so that was uh, the, um, the manner in which I could take ideas that were coming into the areas from earlier on into some kind of a, you know, study of practice and also uh, an extension to more of the world. That's an interesting question because when I decided to go back to school after working at a uh, small liberal arts college in Atlanta, I was a voice major. I had been a, got my undergraduate at the University of Cincinnati in applied voice and also um, a master's in vocal studies at Southern Methodist University in Dallas with a, a second degree, a second master's in conducting for sacred music. So I decided and was entered and was accepted and entered at Florida State University as a DMA uh, student in voice, in applied voice, and decided that hmm, I think I want to do something a little different to at least add on to the knowledge base that I already had in that area. So I said, do I want a third degree in the same exact thing or would I like at least be interested in taking some additional courses? So I decided, why not take the Introduction to Ethnomusicology course? I signed, I enrolled in that, and I also was in the Caribbean Steel Band and in the African Drumming Ensemble because I knew I wanted to have an interest in African-derived music uh, in the New World, or in general in African and African-derived music. So I took those two courses and found that this, wow, this is something, literally a new world was, <laughs> was brought to me and opened up for me. And we had a number of ensembles there. That was under Adele Olson, who is now retired, was the director of the ethnomusicology program there. And then shortly, within a year or two, Michael Bakken came on board. And so as a result of that, I participated in those two events, uh, Ghanaian Drumming Ensemble, led by Ama Adulam, who is a member of SEM, and also with the, um, the uh, Steel Pan group. And I was there for four or five years through or so uh, in both ensembles. I got a chance to perform a little bit on one occasion with the Brazilian ensemble as well. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of those experiences, I knew that I had found another area that was really a place of interest for me. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting making the, the, the shift cognitively, so to speak, from a performance discipline uh, to one that was research oriented, but that still allowed for performance. And that's what I liked about it. And uh, I enjoyed working there as a TA and uh, as a, well, with an assistantship and teaching some of the intro to ethnomusicology, intro to world music classes with the general students at the university. That's actually pretty hard to explain or to answer, even to myself. <laughs> um, um, in high school and college, I was uh, passionately playing the flute. Um, I was actually doing a lot of new music with friends, you know, who were like uh, uh, composers, graduate composers. Um, but I was an anthropology major, mm -hmm. and so I was regarding those things as separate, um, but was beginning to ask questions about the music that I was making, you know, through the lens of cultural anthropology. Um, 
the, the major thing that happened was that um, I was at the University of Pennsylvania. They have an amazing uh, anthropology library there, uh, just gigantic, right? And I spent a lot of time wandering the stacks, uh, often late at night. And I, I literally just stumbled upon two books side by side, and they were Merriam's Anthropology of Music and Judith Becker's book, which had just come out on um, music and nationalism in um, Java. And it, it floored me that, that, first of all, that anthropology and music could appear side by side in the title of a book. And I literally sat down in the stacks and began to read. <laughs> and um, a lot followed, literally, from that moment. I was attracted to music, to ethnomusicology uh, in a class. I was taking a class with Thomas Torino while I was doing my master's, and uh, I was learning so much about Latin American music, and uh, I was kind of like in shock of how little I actually knew. Being myself Latin American, I was born uh, in Colombia, and realizing that there was a lot that I could uh, learn from this course that I didn't, I wasn't really expecting. So I, I started getting into the methodologies, and fell in love with it, and uh, yeah, here I am, 15 years later. <laughs> I was attracted to ethnomusicology because of the opportunity to study non-Western mu non -Western music. Um, I grew up in Orlando, Florida, and studied classical piano from age five all the way through um, undergraduate college. I was a piano major. And uh, at the same time, I engaged with my own uh, tradition of African American music. I, as, an, as a um, high school student, actually a junior high student, I performed in a, a vocal group, female vocal group, uh, of singing songs of the 1960s, including the Shirelles, uh, Motown artists. And, uh, and once I uh, um, in, enrolled in undergraduate college, I formed and led a popular music band called Peaches and Cream with horns and uh, four singers and um, uh, a rhythm section. And in graduate school, I formed another band called Portion of Soul Syndicate, and we specialized pretty much in R&B soul music. So my, my musical interest, while I was engaged with classical piano as a piano major, I was also participating in the African American popular tradition. And I wanted to continue that um, study. I mean, I wanted to continue it, my involvement, but move it to a more formal level of study. Um, so, and, and also, I had an older brother who was in the military in Japan, and he sent me recordings of Japanese music. Uh, the show instrument I remember in the koto, and I was really fascinated by those different sounds. And that led to my interest in just broader uh, musical traditions that I wanted to study. I did not know of the field of ethnomusicology at that time, uh, but my interest in, non in Western and non-Western musics uh, always existed. I have a long and varied career, and I won't go into too much of it right here, but I started off to be a classical Western musician, although I always had some interest in American folk music. But uh, I was in a conservatory at the University of Michigan, and I had an epiphany, I think I probably my freshman or, or sophomore year, I had always been raised that music was a universal language. And then it suddenly occurred to me that people who said that meant that Western high art music between the years 1700 and 1900 should be appreciated by everybody. And that the worlds were filled, I, at that point, was like many people came up um, when I did and were classical musicians, we were very focused on being classical musicians. So I didn't know much about rock, I didn't know much about country, I certainly didn't know much about other world musics. And suddenly I realized that I was totally ignorant, so I signed up for uh, an ethno, a general ethno course, and I loved it. It was with uh, Dr. William Mom, and it was just a world survey of, of world music, as I remember. And it was, I just decided I needed to go into that field. Well, it was kind of a roundabout way. I, um, I'd started in graduate. I was interested in American music, and I hadn't, there was no ethnomusicology program in my um, undergraduate uh, institution. And when I got to Michigan, actually, I um, 
I continued to study music, but I discovered an ethnomusicology program. And so while I didn't go per se in the ethnomusicology program, the type of approach and methodology, methodology and um, exploration was really in tune with my own, my own research. You know, I ended up, as I was building my career, doing a lot of community-based research, um, very interested in context and social and cultural context. Um, I'm also kind of a historian by trade, but really interested in the people's stories and really using that to explore music and its meaning in life. The reason I got into ethnomusicology was that um, I knew that my family was, uh, was being persecuted during the 1950s, and I knew that music was about more than just beauty and technique. It was also about politics and social life, and I wanted to know more about that. And the other reason I decided to go and study music rather than perform it was that my uncle Mike Seeger came through with a band he had called the, the New Lost City Ramblers, and they were playing in a terrible smoky bar in downtown Boston. And I had dinner with them afterwards, and they were so tired, and they were so negative about the tour, and they were so negative about the place, and I thought, there's got to be something more fun than this to do with music. And I was in college at the time, and that was the, that was the decision that took me to study ethnomusicology, or to study music in the Department of Anthropology. and. Um, and then go on to graduate school in anthropology, but always with the intention of working with music.